Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Good afternoon, everyone. We are a little bit thin on the people, but uh, I know it's always an opportunity to be able to make sure that we have more in-depth and interpersonal, uh, intimate conversations afterwards to be able to do that, so that's wonderful. Well, today I wanted to take the time, since I had two messages back-to-back, to maybe hammer out a, a bigger topic. And this is one that uh, is part of the fundamental belief series that I've been going over um, here for the last number of years, but also with the lead up to the fall holy days, it's, ab- it's uh, good for us to remember what it is that we're looking forward to, what it is that we're excited about. And so today I'd like to go over our 15th fundamental belief. This is fundam- fundamental belief number 15, the promises to Abraham. And in the first part of this, I'd like to go over the physical promises to Abraham and his descendants. We'll parse that out at least into the physical. And in the second message, we'll talk about the spiritual. And I may still tack on a third message about it uh, the next time I speak here. But we'll, we'll talk about, again, the physical promises to Abraham and his descendants. I'd like to read over our fundamental beliefs as we do that um, in this series just to bring everybody up to speed. And that is... We believe in God's enduring righteousness. That righteousness is demonstrated by God's faithfulness and fulfilling all the promises he made to the father of the faithful, Abraham. As promised, God multiplied Abraham's lineal descendants so that Abraham literally became the father of many nations. We believe that God, as promised, materially prospered Abraham's lineal descendants, Isaac and Jacob, whose name he later changed to Israel. We believe that God, through Abraham's seed, Jesus Christ, is making salvation available to all humanity, regardless of physical lineage. Salvation is not, therefore, a right of birth. It is freely open to all whom God calls, and those who are regarded as descendants of Abraham are those of the faith, heirs according to the promise. We believe that the knowledge that God has fulfilled and continues to fulfill the physical promises made to Abraham and his children, and that he is fulfilling the spiritual promise of Jesus Christ, is critical to understanding the message of the prophets and its application to the world. This understanding that we have about the promises to Abraham and to his descendants is something that it, uh, can really formulate how we view God's plan as a whole, how we view our part as members, as children, as heirs in that plan. And it's also quite distinct from how many others view our father and their relationship with him. This is one of those things that once we understand about the promises to Abraham, and we understand the, the uh, many layers that are nested in that with what God has said he's doing through Abraham and through his descendants, brings out to its logical end a relationship that we understand to be there that most other Christians don't. And that's a huge thing. So, again, we're, we're on the on the cusp of going into the autumn holy days, this last series of them for the year, we're a mere is it seven weeks away. It's so close. I thought it would be good for us to go through this fundamental belief to remind ourselves to review these promises to Abraham and kind of the basis, the basis upon which, the foundation upon which our understanding for our father and what he is doing is built. So we're going to dive into the physical promises to Abraham and his descendants in this first message. We'll start off by discussing one of the promises that God made, and that is he told Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. He tells a man, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Now, we might be familiar with the uh, command that God had for, for Abraham at that time, he was, his name was Abram, and he's living in Ur of the Chaldees, and he calls him out of there, and he says, I want you to leave this area, go out of there, leave your family, go where I'm going to tell you, and I will make of you a great nation. Let's go, let's turn to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to look at this. Genesis chapter 12, beginning at the beginning of that chapter, verses 1 through 3. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3.
Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. This is very similar to what Jesus Christ told the rich young ruler. When the rich young ruler asked him, Well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, Well, keep the commandments. And the young man says, Well, I've done all of those from my youth. He says, okay, well, then sell all that you have, give to the poor, and then take up your cross and follow me. It's very similar to what God told Abraham. I've given messages about that. Um, God's ask of us has been very consistent across time. He's not asking Abraham or Abram at this time to do anything different than Jesus Christ asked that rich young ruler. There's anything different than what he's asking us to do today. It's, there's a dependency a faith in him that we need to have. He says, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God says, if you go where I tell you to go, I'm going to take care of you. It's not dissimilar if you were to go back to Genesis 2 and 3 and you see the interactions that he has with Adam and Eve. He says, oh, you can live in this garden. Everything that you need is there. Just trust me. Don't eat from this tree. Eat from these others. Right? So we see this initial calling to Abram. Now, if you go forward a few chapters to Genesis chapter 17, Genesis 17, verse 19 probably not an area that we often turn to when we're talking about the promises to Abram. Genesis chapter 17, verse 19. This is in the midst of some uh, family drama that Abram is feeling as he and his wife, uh, Abraham at this time now, he, he's had his name changed. He has a son. His son's name is Ishmael. He does not yet have the son of promise, but um, we have here in verse 17, Chapter 17, verse 19, God said, No, Sarah, your wife shall bear your son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Even though he's already got a son, uh, Ishmael. He says, I will establish my covenant with him. Speaking of Isaac, I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Because Abraham still loved his firstborn son. There was still a connection that was there. But he says, as for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I shall make him a great nation. If you uh, have a few hours to go down a rabbit hole, you can go and you can do some research into the understanding of the, the, the very, uh, the differences as far as where um, Islam and Christianity diverge when they're looking, they both trace their lineage back to Abraham as a forefather. But um, those of followers of Islam look at it, this as the promise was being to be fulfilled through Ishmael and not through, uh, through Isaac as we understand. But they're looking back and they're seeing this because they see, well, Ishmael is going to be blessed. So clearly there's a blessing from God. But verse 21 we see, it says, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac. So there is this distinction. It's not with Ishmael, even though I know you got acknowledged that Abraham had the son Ishmael. He says, I'm going to take care of him. And there's still a blessing that goes down through, a blessing towards the lineage of Ishmael as far as being a great nation. You have 12 kids. I know a, a number of people uh, who come from large families. And when you have large families and then you go and you see in, uh, invariably on their, on their wall, on somebody's mantle in their house, there is just a... They're all in front of a beach because that's about the only backdrop that you can have that's going to be big enough to have the whole family. And they're all boom. And you got like 30 or 40 people. And they'll tell you, ah, and that was only about like 25% of them, right? I mean, so-and-so couldn't be here. But it's like they have these huge families. There is a lineage that comes with that. And there's a blessing that God said, you know what? Even though he's not the son of promise, I'm going to also bless you through your son Ishmael. But the covenant and this is a big difference. We talked about this when we were talking about Obadiah in the background to that with, with uh, Esau and Jacob. Blessing and covenant. There is a blessing that God will give and pass along, but cutting a covenant is very distinctly different. And we need to have this 
as a backdrop, uh, uh, an anchor point in our minds when we're talking about the promises to Abraham, okay? There are blessings, there are covenants. Those are two different things. Now, you can have blessings when you're a part of a covenant, but blessings and covenants are two different things, right? So God was willing to bless Ishmael, but when it came to the covenant and the promise, what he was cutting as far as the contract, you know, you enter into contracts differently. You might say, you know what, I'm willing to gift you this, and you might make a donation to a, uh, a nonprofit organization. But you might not go and try to hire the same people and come into a contract with the individuals who, to whom you are willing to give a donation, right? So God's willing to bless Ishmael, but the covenant here is going through Isaac, who we read in verse 21, whom, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So he had this conversation with Abraham. He lets him know there is still going to be a blessing for your son Ishmael. He's going to be a great and large, uh, prosperous nation, a company of nations, 12 from him, 12 princes. And it wasn't just, uh, it'd be nice, you know, you, you have the doctor child, you have the lawyer child, you have the, uh, you know, the teacher, you have the philosopher. He's like, you're going to have 12 princes for sons. Like, wow. They're not doing too bad. That's quite a blessing that God says he's going to take care of, of Ishmael, uh, who is Abraham's seed. So there's this promise again that he is going to make from Abraham, Abram, when he didn't have any children. And he was, he was 86 when he had, when, when uh, Ishmael was born to Hagar. He's 86. The only modern day equivalent I could say to that would probably be the, the, the past Senator Strom Thurmond. Uh, had many children. If you go, to, he was a senator, I believe it was from Georgia or one of the Carolina, South Carolina, South Carolina. And it's like he had children far off into his 80s. That doesn't happen. Well, Abraham is blessed to be able to have a, a child. And then he's blessed to have the child that was actually promised to him, not the one that he went about trying to make happen. Uh, again, echoing a lot, of the, a lot of the discussion we had when we were talking about Esau and Jacob, there is always going to be interpersonal friction when we try to force God's hand and outcome based on what we think he should be doing, which is what Abraham and Sarah did through Hagar, which is what uh, um, Rebecca and Jacob did um, in, in getting the not only the birthright, but also the, the blessing the, uh, that uh, Esau was expecting. Every time you go through scripture and you see people who try to force the hand, what you end up with is frustration in the end. All right, let's also turn over to Genesis 46. We see here a couple generations down the road, but this blessing of being made into a great nation carries on. And here now we're looking at Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Also um, known as Israel at this time. So Israel, or Jacob, took his journey. This is uh, Genesis 46, verse 1. Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. You see, at this time, there was famine. This is uh, after Joseph had been taken. He thought he was dead. All of these things that had been going on in his life that were just the fruits of the decisions that he had made. Uh, but he was worried about going down to Egypt. And the reason he was worried is because he had had the conversation with God before at, at Bethel saying, oh, this is the land. I'm going to give you this area that I promised to your grandfather and to your father. And he appeared to him in that vision and he had the angels going up and down. He'd wrestled with him when he was coming back and he was saved uh, from, uh, from the, the confrontation with Esau. He knew where the promised area was, what God said, this is the area I'm going to give you. And uh, so he's having some difficulty. I, I shouldn't say difficulty. He's having concerns about whether or not he should go down to Egypt. So what God tells him is, as, do not fear. This is verse 3 again, partway through that. He says, do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. 
This is again is very similar to what God told um, Judah through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, "Stop fighting. Pray that there is peace in Babylon, because when you go there, I want you guys to be able to, I want you to be able to proliferate. I want you to prosper, have many children there, so that you will be a company of people again when I come back in seventy years to take you out and to bring you back to your home." So he says to, to Jacob or to Israel. Um, I will make of you a great nation there in Egypt. I will go down with you to Egypt. This is verse 4. And I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. That's quite a promise for for Jacob. It's not only that I'm going to, I'll be with you when you go there, but I'll also make sure that you come back. Um, Again, remember the prayer that Jacob said when he went, uh, it, at Bethel, he says, if you will be with me and bring me to my kinsman, to my my uh, my uncle's house in safety, you know, then you will be my God. And then when he's coming back, he's like, if you'll protect me when I'm interacting with my brother, because uh, we did not leave on the best terms, uh, then you will be my God, right? And, and so he keeps having these interactions with, with God, and God says, you know what? I'm going to be with you when you go down, and I will bring you back. Those things that before Jacob or Israel had to ask for, um, God is promising to him again this promise that he will make of Abraham or of uh, his descendants a great nation a second thing that God promises to Abraham is that he's going to give a home to his descendants forever he tells Abraham I will give a home to your descendants forever we kind of scratch the surface of this let's go back to Genesis 13 Genesis chapter 13 He tells Abraham, I will give your descendants a home forever. Genesis chapter 13, pick up in verse 14. We'll read down to verse 17. Genesis 13, verse 14 is where we'll start. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes. Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And if you remember, there were two areas of land. There was the plain that was before them that was well watered. And Lot said, Dibs, I'll take that space. And then there was kind of the mountainous place. Now, uh, I had the wonderful blessing of being able to be on the plains here in Illinois. And then I went up to Alaska, and I had the wonderful blessing of being able to be on the top of mountains. It might seem obvious, but you can see farther if you're standing on top of a mountain than you can if you're just on the flat plain. Standardly, I think generally speaking, you've got about six six miles of visual range if it's perfectly flat and the corn's short, right? Uh, You can see about six miles. You're like, oh, look. So if I turn around, you got uh, uh, six miles circular around you all the places you can see take that times pi 3.14 you got about 18 to 19 square miles that you'd be like haha this is my space you start going up and you go up a few hundred feet a thousand feet you can see miles and miles farther and god's telling abraham he says you know what look out lift your eyes you're not down in that well-watered plain you can see all this to the north to the south to the east to the west All that you can see, I will give your people. Let's go back here. I lost my spot here as I was going off on a tangent. Um, Verse 15, it says, "For, For the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Now, at this time, he did not have... Isaac. At this time, he did have, uh, he did have Ishmael. All right, so he's got one son. One son is not sand of the sea. So there's still a little bit of uh, faith that is necessary here. But God promises that He says, "I'm going to make your descendants as the dust of the earth, and if you can number that, then you can, your descendants can also be numbered." Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And so Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron. 
So he's there. He's in the midst of it. Again, Hebron, if you were to look at the map in the back of your Bible, is right there. Uh, Jerusalem, it's in the middle of it. He's there, and God is cutting this. He's having this covenant, this reminder with him. He says, look up. Look around and see all that I'm going to give you. This is a wonderful land. Just two chapters later, in chapter 15, let's pick it up in verse 18. This is something that uh, I thought it struck a chord with me as I was reading this and, and wanted to keep make sure that this was in here when we were talking about the discussions later on for his descendants with Esau and Jacob talking about the blessing and the amount of the blessing or the, uh, uh, the birthright that, uh, that Jacob received. Because I read this and I was like, huh. This is uh, Genesis 15, verse 18. It says, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt, which is the Nile, to the great river, the river Euphrates. Have you ever looked at your map to see what that space is? Now, the Nile actually almost bisects the entire land of Egypt. It, 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 it's not bisect, because it's about a third of Egypt's land mass is to the east of the Nile, um, and in two-thirds of its land mass to the west. Now, it comes to a head there with the Red Sea, Going down below, you get the Sinai Peninsula area that's there, that triangle in the middle. And then you go up, and you have Saudi Arabia. You have the Mediterranean. And north of Saudi, like north and to the, uh, to the east of Saudi Arabia, you have Iraq. And going through the heart of Iraq, through Baghdad, through Basra area, you have uh, the Euphrates. And the Euphrates goes all the way up into Turkey before it loops back to the east. Now, it actually splits if you look at some different maps of the Euphrates. Now, I'm not exactly sure what landmass exactly God is talking about. Maybe he's just saying the portion of the Nile that's right there by the, Suez, by the Sinai Peninsula, maybe that's what he's talking about, and that's where you take the Nile. But he's saying from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. Does that include the Arabian Peninsula? <laughs> Does that include? I don't know, but it's huge. Any way, you, any way you look at it or measure it, it's way bigger than what they ever had as the promised land. We do get a little bit of uh, some of the, the caveats here. Uh, well, I shouldn't even say caveats. Some of the descriptions of those who, who are in the area. Um, and that is in, uh, um, where are we? We're in 15 verse uh, 19 now. Uh, it says, the Kenites... The Kenizzites, the the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. These are all people who are living there in the area that God is promising to uh, to Abraham and his descendants. Right now, God did ultimately give the space, the land mass that those tribes inhabited to his people, to the descendants of abraham but again depending on how liberal you are with the boundaries that god gave being from the nile to the euphrates it's obviously going to be bound by the uh, mediterranean over on the uh, on the west side but that's a lot of landmass that was not there i also find that interesting because uh traditionally the concept that the uh, the uh, Garden of Eden is somewhere would have been somewhere in that uh, Mesopotamian Valley as well, and so was that Promised Land area all a part of that massive area? Um, not sure, but I thought it interesting here as we're looking at what the what the promise was. And again, there are a lot of times that God has made amazing promises, but then because of the actions of His people, is not able to fulfill the promise to its fullness, right? And that's where the, the beauty of Christ is there. There's a fullness that is there that could never be, never be granted through uh, any other means or any other opportunity because what, the moment you tell somebody you're going to give them something, they go and they Jeroboam it. They're like, well, I'll make that happen myself. They, they do what Abraham and Sarah did. They do what uh, Rebecca and Jacob did. They do uh, all these different things to try to make it happen. Um, but... Uh, Again, there's a, a level of humility that we need to have. But God is here promising to give Abraham and his descendants a home forever. 
Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9. We'll read the first six verses. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Verses 1 through 6. Here, Israel is about to cross over and inherit, for the first time, the physical land that was promised to Abraham. And we read, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself. Not necessarily in number, but definitely in military prowess. These were a bunch of people who had just come out of slavery and to Leave that mindset behind you is a very difficult thing. So these nations are greater and mightier than they. Cities great and fortified up to heaven. A people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall dry them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. So God is going before. He's essentially saying, I'm going to fight your battles for you. I'm the one who's going to consume them with the fire, and all you have to do is finish them off. He's doing all the hard work. Verse 4. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you. After I've done all the work, don't think in your heart. Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. I tell you, we deserve this. This is a good win for us. We should be here. This has been promised to us. All these things that people can say, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is is driving them out from before you. If you actually uh, should have had you keep your spot over there in Genesis 15, but you'll see when God goes over those nations in the preceding verses, when he's talking to Abram, he says, all of this space, but you can't have it yet because the iniquity of the inhabitants has not reached its fullness. So this bears out with everything that we understand about God when he cuts a covenant or when he has an agreement with people he says you know what i'm going to give you a choice but there does come a point where no i'm not going to hear your prayers no i'm not going to listen anymore the time for that is done you've missed the opportunity the door is closed and you can't open it there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth so you get to this point where iniquity has has reached its threshold and so the iniquity at this time has reached its threshold and now it's because of their wickedness that the lord is driving them out from before Israel. Verse 5, it is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land. This is something that I find very intriguing. I grew up in uh, uh, Ohio and I remember going through social studies and the, uh, and the American history. And what was it called as we were coming across? We, I shouldn't say we because my dad was still in Europe, but manifest destiny. Exactly, right? You remember the term manifest destiny. We were going across. And it was, it was the destiny of, Christian, of Christians and of the Anglo-Saxon people to come across, and God was just opening the door for the nation. And there were many people who said, well, it's because we are the righteous, because we have the true religion that God is opening the door and doing all of these things for us. Oh, they justified a lot of stuff. They had that mindset that right here God tells Israel, don't have that mindset. Don't think it's because of your righteousness. Don't think it's because uh, of something that you have done. Um, But we actually see, he says, verse 5, halfway through, it says, But because of the wickedness of these nations, that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and he may fulfill the words which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God has not given you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. It is a wonderful study. I'm actually in the middle of working through it. Uh, um, The number of times God says he's going to do something, not for your sake, but for the sake of my servant David, but for the sake of the, but for my name's sake. He says that. He says, it's for, not for you. It's for my name's sake because I promised this. So he's going to go through and do something. <laughs> not because we deserve it, but because he said, I said I was going to do it. So therefore, I'm going to do it regardless of what you're doing. 
because I make good on my promises. I do what I said I was going to do, unlike you, unlike me, right? So God is doing these things. He's saying, because I made this promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, because these nations have gone to the top of the cup as far as their iniquity, and so there are consequences for how they're living. But in doing so, what God, is to do, what God was doing for his people was giving them a home, giving a home to the descendants of Abraham forever. A third thing about these promises to Abraham is that they are also to his descendants because we see them across time passed down from one to the other. And this is one of those things that if you remember the, uh, I think I've brought out the promise that God made to, uh, to David. People are like, oh yeah, if David would follow him and so Solomon was set up. And so now there's always going to be a son of David on a throne forever because he listened to God. And I pointed out that that's the same exact promise he made to Saul. If Saul would have done it, he'd have had the same outcome. He would have had the same opportunity, right? Well, passing down promises is something that God is very happy and willing to do. And again, sometimes it's, as we just read here, not for the sake of the, uh, of the uh, descendants, but it's for the sake of the promise that he made. Uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 26. Chapter 26 of Genesis. Genesis chapter 26, we'll pick it up verse 2. We'll read through to verse 5. Genesis chapter 26, verse 2. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give these lands. And I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. So he's telling this to Isaac. He says, hey, Isaac, go where I tell you, and I will also make good on the promises, the same promises that I made to your father, which were, I will make of you a great nation, and I will give this land that you see to your descendants, right? So he says, I'm going to do the same thing. You go where I tell you to go. Again, same exact promise, same agreement that he made with Abraham. And so Isaac does this. Uh, God went on. Uh, verse 4, he says, I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. So he listened to God. He obeyed God. And as a result, those promises that God made were passed down to him and to his descendants. Sometimes we can, we can think that we're passing things down, but it's important to note that it is God who's passing this down. Let's go to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 27. We have Isaac here. Now, God had passed the blessing from Abraham down to Isaac in chapter 26. In chapter 27 here, it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau, his older son, and he said to him, my son. Esau answered and said, here I am. He said, behold, now I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, your bow, and go out to the field to hunt game for me, to make savory food such as I love and bring it to me and I, that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before, before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I hear your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me the game. And so what we have is we have the conniving and the uh, surreptitiousness to get that blessing. But what we have here is Isaac looking to pass on the blessing. Okay? Now, if we go back to the first part of this story when Rebecca has the twins in her womb we covered this again last week when we were talking about uh, um, uh, the prequel to, o to o the book of Obadiah we know that God prophesied when when she asked what's going on he says well you have two nations and the younger will serve the older and there is going to be greater than and we have these we have this um, prop prophetic uh, statement that's given to uh, Rebecca and she goes to try to make that happen Isaac is here, and he's trying to pass on a blessing, 
right? And when you read the blessing that he gave to Jacob, thinking that it was Esau, I wonder, I wonder whether or not he was trying to reverse what God had said was going to happen because he thought he gave that to Esau. And he was so scared when he, he's trembling when he starts to have the conversation with Esau. Well, who, who was here before? I already gave that blessing. Because God says this is what's going to happen. So then we actually see Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. Um, Jacob is still, uh, Isaac is still alive. Jacob leaves. He's sent out and he's told by his father to go marry someone uh, not from not from Canaan. So he goes out from Beersheba here in, in uh, chapter 28, verse 10 of Genesis. Jacob went out from Beersheba and he went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down at that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up to heaven and its top reached to the heavens. Um, and there, there the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. God passed along the blessing. You see, we can do whatever we might think and we can say, and I know there are places in Scripture where we might have used opportunity or taken, taken license, and, you know, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. God says, well, we know in James that's only according to his will. You can say something, you can ask for something, but unless it's according to God's will, there's not a whole lot of weight to it. So God here, God is the one who passes along the blessing. He passes it. It went from Abraham to Isaac. He did that passing. He appeared to Isaac and he said, here's the covenant I'm going to cut with you. He appeared to Jacob as Jacob is leaving his father's house and he passed the blessing on to Jacob. And so it goes down. Chapter 48 here in Genesis. Genesis 48. Pick up in verse 8. Israel saw Joseph's sons. He's there. They're in Egypt. He sees Joseph's sons and he says, who are these? And Joseph says to his father, these are my sons whom God has given me in this place. He said, please bring them to me and I will bless them. So the story goes, his eyes were dim. He can't see. He does. Uh, he puts his right hand over the younger, uh, onto the younger, which is Ephraim, and, and uh, his left hand onto the older, which is Manasseh. And he gives them a blessing. And he passes the blessing on, the blessing of Abraham and Isaac, on to Ephraim and Manasseh. If you wanted to go to uh, chapter 49, verses 22 to 26, you actually see there's a lot more there, uh, specifically about Joseph. Um, let's go to uh, Genesis 49, verses 22 through 26. Um, as Joseph is speaking his final words to his, his sons, his 12 sons, he says in verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him. But his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From, for there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your fathers who will help you and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brothers. Now, it's interesting to note nothing of what Israel, Jacob, is saying here is opposed to what God had revealed to him already. You remember, Joseph had dreams. He was a dreamer. He says, oh, I had a dream, and these sheaves all bowed down to me. I had a dream, and the sun, the moon, and the stars all bowed down to me. And it says, Jacob kept that in his heart. He remembered it. 
It's like, oh, you know, he was still having the parent and be like, oh, I got an uppity kid. But he didn't just let it go. He remembered. And so as he's giving these blessings to Joseph, unlike some of the predecessors, unlike what he experienced as he took from Esau the blessing, he's giving a blessing 100% in, uh, uh, in keeping with what God had promised. So these physical blessings are passed down, and we see them actually later on. They go, and uh, not only is Jacob's name Israel, but we see them uh, passed down to the, the children of Israel as they go into the promised land. And if you go and you review the blessings that uh, Jacob gives to all of his other sons here in the, in the previous verses here in chapter 49, you can, you can begin to, to track perhaps where these people are based on how um, these blessings, these prophecies have come, uh, come to pass, and you can see where they end up. Now, generally speaking, the churches of God have taught that uh, the blessing of Israel was passed on to Ephraim and Manasseh because, again, uh, what Jacob said, or what Israel said, he says, let these two be like my own. Right? And so he took Ephraim and Manasseh. We read that in uh, chapter 48. They were like his. He gave the blessing to them. So we have the, the, the combination of the blessing that is there in Genesis 48 for Ephraim and Manasseh with the blessing that was there to Joseph here in, in Genesis 49. And so we see that, and they're primarily, uh, um, as we understand them to be, to be manifest among the English-speaking nations. You have the United States um, as Manasseh, the older but not as great, not as ruling over like it was for um, Ephraim, which would be the British Commonwealth and peoples there. Now, again, I'd like to point out there is a big difference between being the recipient of a blessing, which we read in Deuteronomy chapter 9, being the recipient of a blessing for the sake of God's promise to his patriarchs, and the relationship there. A big difference between being the recipient of a blessing and being in a spiritual covenant with God. And this is where I think sometimes when we start talking about the English-speaking nations and the British Commonwealth and we start talking about the blessings of God, there is a, a groundswell of opposition to that in our nation today because a lot of people will take that and, and extrapolate from it that just because you have the physical blessing, you must be also in a spiritual covenant. Those are two very different things, okay? Uh, there is there's nothing that we can point to that will show that those individuals who founded this country, while they may have been more spiritual and faithful than uh, people might be today, there's nothing that we can show that they were in a spiritual covenant with God. But we can all very clearly see when we look at the blessings that were promised to Ephraim, to Manasseh, to Joseph, and we extrapolate out, you can say, these Physical blessings are clearly there. That doesn't make the whole nation God's people. So, uh, in closing here, because we're going to look at the spiritual side of things in the next message, um, if we are stiff-necked, as we read in Deuteronomy 9, we will lose out on the physical blessings, as well as the spiritual blessings. Ultimately, the passing down of the blessings is up to God. Uh, We might want to be able to pass something on, much like what uh, Isaac wanted to, much like what Jacob wanted to, but unless it's in accordance with what God's will is and what he is trying to pass along, there is no promise that that's going to happen because they are blessings from God. They are his promises to his servants. And so as long as we are striving to be his servants, we have the opportunity then to have both the physical and the spiritual that we'll talk about in the second message. Thank you, Mr. Eckema. Brethren, if you would, <clears throat> please rise now, and we'll sing hymn number 124, Our Thanks, O God, for Parents.